Hey everybody, welcome back. Can it be three videos in less than, well, a month for sure. So welcome back to the musical tour of The Spiral from Wizard 101. We are looking at a track from Lemuria, which is the latest world just released. And the tunes of Lemuria are so diverse that I needed to look at a few of the different tunes to get into the thought process. And this is the third and final tune that accompanies the part of Lemuria known as uh, Heat. It was like the, the junkyard of the spiral getting you know just a bunch of things kind of thrown together heap was kind of thrown together and neglected so i think that's why uh the artist decided to kind of paint it all in the in mostly black and white color palette when this part of lemuria was described to me i mentally started rubbing my hands together and licking my chops because i have a jazz background a lot of my education was from a jazz perspective so i was really looking forward to kind of get into this and and figure it out notes that i was given from king's isle which said basically this is our gangster film noir detective zone it's the city like in dick tracy the shadow and other tales like that uh, they were actually thinking that some kind of batman inspired elfman uh, themes might work and nothing against Mr. Elfman. I'm a big fan of his stuff, but I, I I felt like maybe a more jazz-based score might be really interesting to play with here because it's so, I mean, it's in black and white. It, it stands out from the rest of, I mean, the spiral, you know, not just Lemuria. It's like, this is the only area of the game where there's a, you know, exceedingly limited color palette here. Uh, the notes went on to say, be nice to have that resonating reverbed out solo brass in there somewhere, the lazy noir jazz brass. So that's what I was given and I took that and ran with it. Uh, so here it is the heap theme. There's the loop. I actually just muted everything so it wouldn't uh, roll back into the beginning section to give it a little bit of an ending there. All right, so you can't say this ain't uh, film noir. I think I've talked before about the private detective chord, which is the minor major nine chord. A minor major nine chord to me, it's it's the private detective chord because it's it's got a little of that raised eyebrow mystery to it. Uh, the major seven uh, against the minor triad. So everybody's used to hearing the minor sound, and the, but when you put, really gives you, to me it's the, it's the raised eyebrow, one raised eyebrow. Hmm. And then you put a nine on top of there, which is a spicy little ex chord extension. Right, I mean, it just sounds like mystery and intrigue. So that's kind of where, where that comes from. So I also use that tonality and dragon spire give it kind of an end of the world intrigue you know dramatic sound here i'm using it not quite so in, intense and you know 
it doesn't sound like the end of the world, just a little more, you know, there's something mysterious going on in here. So I love film noir scoring. I loved uh, all the stuff that Bernard Herrmann did with the Alfred Hitchcock films. And one of the tunes that was given to me as uh, kind of a reference idea was the score from Double Indemnity by Miklos Rocha, which really gave me a lot of, you know, ideas and flavors and, and textures. I think uh, film noir, you know, it's it's in black and white, and it's all about kind of the shadow and the light, giving us kind of the shades of gray in between, both literally in the in the colors of the film and also in uh, the characterizations. Right? Nobody's necessarily good or bad. It's you know, even the heroes are flawed. Like everybody's everybody's human. That was what kind of film noir sort of became about. And I think the the scores really do represent that. There's a lot of texture in there. It's not just this is a happy moment. This is a sad moment. There's a lot of, you know, nostalgia and melancholy, all kinds of real human emotions tied up in the score. So at the beginning here, I'm, I'm playing with the, with the minor major nine in the harp here. And then what came out next uh, was the trumpet line. I do play trumpet and I thought this would be a good time to, to break it out. So here's my uh, trumpet tracks. There's a lot of a lot of parts that happen at the end that I kept recomposing. So <laughs> there is. Uh, it's not like I played this all at once. I played it, you know, through a few times and fixed some parts for for tuning and stuff. Um, now I'm using a Harmon mute, which is a all metal mute that you insert in the bell of the trumpet, and it gives it kind of really a nasal metallic sound. <laughs> So the melody it's pretty much playing is it's playing with that ninth, which is from the chord, the C minor major nine. So it's really leaning heavily on that. So already you're kind of not sure who's good, who's bad, who's on your side. So you're not really sure if it's, you know, a, a positive melody or, or a negative melody. It just sounds, you know, it's still got that raised eyebrow, you know, question mark. I'm not, not sure what's happening here. And not to spoil anything, but one of the heroes in this part of the land, you're never quite sure, you know, if she's giving you the, the straight deal. You're never sure if she's, you know, telling you the truth or is she good? Is she bad? Is she working? Is she working for the forces of good or the forces of evil? Providing some accompaniment to this, I've got the woodwinds. I knew I wanted to use a lot of woodwind stuff. It was very pervasive in the film noir scores. And just because they're, I mean, they're very textural. I think the, I think of the brass as, you know, pretty bombastic. They just provide the, you know, epic, glorious stuff. Not that they can't do other textures, but not the same way that I think the woodwinds can. So here I just have a clarinet and a flute backing up those chords. So there's a location in the section that uses a very famous painting, very reminiscent of the kind of the film noir era. And that's Edward Hopper's 1942 painting called Nighthawks. Really, really famous painting. And it's just kind of like, you know, a lonely diner in the middle of the city. It's at night. Nobody's really in a hurry. They're just maybe having clandestine meetings or, or can't sleep or whatever. It's kind of a lonely city painting. And that took a lot of inspiration from this painting in terms of the, the emotions that I wanted to convey. It couldn't be in a hurry, so it's a pretty slow tempo. On the subject of tempo, I don't, I don't really feel like I hear people talk about this a lot. I might write something and then after kind of fully discovering where it's going, decide that the tempo needs to be a little faster, a little slower. I wanted this piece to breathe a little bit. You'll see that there's uh, some tempo changes in the piece, just getting in and out of different sections. All right, the alto flute is a kind of an unusual instrument. It's not used all the time. It is a very low pitched sound. It doesn't speak very well when there's other instruments playing. So you usually use it in a more exposed context. Here I've got it doubling the trumpet line. So really ghostly 
sound there. So this kind of uh, tick tock of the of the clock, I guess. Vibes, uh, I mentioned in the other two Lemuria videos that I wanted to use the vibes everywhere because they were sort of a glue that was gonna hold a lot of the stuff together under the guise of pretending that this was all kind of the same orchestra. So they had a vibes player and the vibes are pretty flexible. So they probably would have put it in every tune uh, no matter what the style was. So if there's stuff that's a little more, you know, world music, it could sound like tonal percussion from other world musics. We also used it in the Hawaiian Ursai village to be sort of chill and relaxed where we use the vibrato of the vibraphone uh, to kind of give it that hazy, you know, quality. And here we're sort of letting them ring out, kind of making the woodwind section into more of like bell tones. <laughs> And also in more jazz context, the vibes, you know, really give you a good shorthand into that world, so. What's interesting here, it feels like we're playing with the tempo a bit, but it's not, it's just sort of going through different feels in the same tempo. dragged some of the chords playing down to here, but then it's right back into the same tempo. You'll notice the, the tempo ruler up here doesn't change. The harmony that makes jazz sound like jazz is all these two fives. So we're in F up here, but we're going to the key of D, this should say minor, and it's a minor seven flat nine again. Um, so we just use um, the chord built on the second degree of D minor, which is E minor seven flat five, and then the five is the A seven flat nine to D. So we get back into uh, the minor major. I've been trying to think about how I write these tunes and um, what occurs to me first. Do I write the melody or the chord changes, the rhythm? Uh, in this case, it was definitely the chords here. I knew I wanted to go to the key of D and mess around with that, but I didn't actually have the melody. So I didn't have any of this melody, um, which is why the melody kind of sounds like it's it's just sort of exploring around, trying to figure out what it is. You know, it's really kind of lost. And again, that's part of the mindset. You know, I'm like, here I am in this, you know, dark city. What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, you know, believing the right people? All of that came out once I kind of provided this atmosphere. Then it was a lot of fun to just sort of uh, mess around with the melodies. Back to the alto flute because there's because there's not a lot of instruments playing here. <laughs> This interplay between the three woodwind instruments really came out of just exploring it. I came up with this alto flute melody and then it felt natural to pass it off to the clarinet. And then I'm like, okay, we're really low. Maybe a nice little harmony, you know, should join it. So the flute comes in up there. And this uh, kind of blossoming of the harmony here of the chords really led me to this next section, which this is a really famous quote. I didn't think that I'd be fooling anybody or, you know, nobody would get this reference. This Rhapsody in Blue uh, part, it just, for some reason, I was kind of messing around with these chords and it just kept kind of opening like a flower. And in film noir, there's people that are trying to become better people or trying to be better people and trying to escape their you know darker past. So it felt very natural to kind of let this sort of unfold. And I thought at the beginning, I was like, ah, this should be, you know, film noir has got to be dark and, you know, mysterious the whole time. But it really felt right to bring it out. 
And then Rhapsody in Blue, to me, just sounds so much like New York. It just feels like a city. It sounds like a city, you know, in the teens and 20s, you know, bustling city that's hopeful, but also kind of realistic and has its dingy side. And I also think I had um, Debussy's Claire Loon playing around in my head a little bit too, which is where some of this more delicate opening, flower opening uh, ideal comes from. Some people ask me like what instrument I play. I usually say keyboard instead of piano because I don't feel like a piano player and I don't compose piano parts very often, but I, I knew that piano was sort of the voice here. There's some fun Gershwin vibes in there. I wasn't sure how this would play out. This clarinet sound is from Cine Samples. I didn't know how that climb would be. Um, that's a that's a universally uh, reviled part for clarinetists because it's so exposed it's it's a solo player and it's sort of in the the altissimo register which is if not done carefully is also known as the squeaky register of the clarinet very kind of technical uh climbing up these notes you'll notice the velocities here are really important to getting the right sound out of that it has to climb up from the dynamics have to crescendo there <laughs> So nice little tip of the hat to some of the orchestral pieces that inspired some of the classic film noir scores here. So I'm actually gonna skip this next part for a second because I wanna go to this section. This section was uh, a part that came out of me, you know, playing around with kind of a more of a Dick Tracy vibe uh, and also inspired by uh, scores like The Untouchables. There's kind of a, a shorthand into that world with kind of low piano bass lines. So right before this section, we get a two, five into the B flat. Two chord, five chord. And then all of a sudden it goes kind of Dick Tracy, a little West Side Story. I was really feeling the snaps. I'm like, those have to come in, even if it's just for a second here. So sort of a unusual bass line here. I think I played around with a more traditional bass line and it was like it it needed more eyebrow <laughs> needed more raised eyebrow there so B flat F B F sharp so really kind of twisting that tonality up a little bit but the uh, the melody here pretty much stays in B flat I initially had written a uh, extended version of that that was a little too jazzy and I, I wanted to go back to like the film noir darker vibe. It felt a little too traditional just to keep it a straight jazz score here. But just a little hint there felt really good. So now we'll go back and take it into that section. I would say this is definitely inspired by some uh, older, like Mancini, Henry Mancini scores, Pink Panther, Days of Wine and Roses, um, a little bit on the schmaltier side of it. I remember writing the melody on the piano, like with the piano sound, so these guys, and felt like a dinner club, a small jazz combo, trying to just set the mood, but not be too obvious about it uh, at a dinner club.
So sometimes how I get to the tune, it's not necessarily linear. Sometimes there are sections that I'll write that don't feel right, you know, where they are. As you've seen in other videos, I'll push them to the end and then try to use them because, you know, I like them enough to keep them around, but sometimes I just don't get to use them because the tune doesn't go that direction. So it just felt right at the end to just have that big flan. So this is known as a fall and normally there is a, maybe there's a key switch or there's a sample that just falls off that note and you sample the instrumentalist playing that fall because it's really hard to emulate it like I wound up doing here. It actually wound up sounding okay. And again, I think it's actually a testament to these uh, Cinesample sounds, you know, sounding so good uh, in their attacks and the transitions between uh, one note and the next. Easier to do them with the flute and clarinet. It's harder to do it with the chord that the uh, big band horns sound is playing. So we're obviously on a B flat chord. F the five, A the major seven, and then D flat, which is the minor third. So we're playing with that minor major sound again. I think I probably went in and played each one of these notes, you know, individually. Da -da 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 Da -da 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 -da. Playing it one at a time is simulating what the ensemble is actually doing. Nobody's falling at the same rate. They're not playing the you know each individual note at the same time or the same speed or the same dynamic. And when you take it apart, it still sounds good. I think that usually when I expose some of these parts for the videos, it's like, uh, that doesn't sound that great. But that works fine, especially with the bass and the drum kit underneath it. What's this bongo part? Oh yeah, Babalu. This is the bongo player doing a little roll on there. That's gonna help distract a little bit so that this fall sounds even better. <laughs> Guys, that wraps it up. That wraps up Lemuria, uh, again, for now. So please let me know if there's uh, any other tracks from Lemuria that I could cover or from one of the uh, other worlds too. At this point, I'm gonna try and get back to uh, the main worlds. I think we have three of them left. Uh, Wizard City, Mirage, and, oh, and how could I forget? Aquila! Dun, 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 dun. So uh, I'd like to finish those out, I think. Also let me know down in the comments. Uh, I released three tracks from this world. I didn't really see the, the viewership rate, you know, really hitting on that. So do you prefer it when there's like huge amounts of time in between videos? <laughs> Does that give you time to like reset your appetite for listening to me blather on for 20 minutes about something? Let me know. I will try to adapt. All right, guys, thank you very much. I'll catch you later. <laughs>